Okay. Man, I'm in the sunshine. It's been so overcast here for like ever. And so sunshine, I don't want to, it's actually raining out right now. No, it's raining off the trees. All right. So here we go. There's a line I've been, you know, I started off listening to Talking Heads again this morning, and that's never good for all of you, actually, <laughs> when I'm thinking about the Talking Heads. But um, one of the things that it reminded me, it was same as it ever was, which I've talked about before, but it reminded me of a line I heard. There are a couple of intersecting themes I want to... Um, these are ideas and concepts. Someone needs to be muted. Um, ideas and concepts that um, kind of all, they're similar, they're not the same. And see, that's the thing I think about yoga. People get hung up exactly on what, what word means and whatever. But I think that the, the realization that yoga is trying to pass on is energetic it's an energetic realization um, of whatever, you know, whatever word you want to choose. And one of the, um, one of the lines that, that I've done a fair amount of thinking about, but I'm going to start off with this one is, have you ever heard somebody say it's a Zen thing that they want, they want Zen practitioners to have a beginning mind, right? Here, here's a word we, we tend to use and and often like whatever that means right but often there's um a feeling like no matter what you know you should have a beginning mind right you should like be open to learning new stuff that might but i put forward that that's probably not as deep as what they mean right that in fact if you're thinking well I, I want to learn everything I can. You're already having a sophisticated thought of knowledge, right? You're already kind of matured and knowing that you don't, you know, some things you don't know everything and you need to be a beginning learner. I don't think that's what they're talking about. One of the reasons way back I've been, I've been, um, this is a great book. Good God. I'm still stuck in it 32 years later, Zen flesh, Zen bones. But I've been thinking about a, a very early little short story in there that I read. And this, this monk goes up to the teacher and says, enlighten me. And the teacher looks at him and says, go wash your bowl. And that's the whole story, right? That's the whole one line story. And I've thought about that. That's one of the only ones in the beginning part of that book. Again, I'm only in the second book, second section of it, 32 years later. Um, is that is that one thing about Zen is they're trying to realize transcendent energy in ordinary experience, right? So, and realize what it is to be here. So Zen tends to emphasize certain simple things without having things having to be more dramatic to realize what's actually happening here. Like, so go wash your bowl, right? is is that's the beginning right i mean go wash your bowl take care of it and figure out how to wash your bowl right and learn from it so that's not a question of knowledge the person already knows how to wash their bowl right so then i also have you ever thought about why we protect innocence so much why is innocence so to so me beginning mind and innocence have something to do with each other Right. And innocence, you know, like I, the image I have of innocence is when like a, a baby starts to realize things, right? Like a little baby and all of a sudden it's like so new. Right. And, and, and you can just see them go like, oh my God, the world has this in it. Right. And maybe a beginning mind maybe has more to do with innocence than you might think. Right. So, and what's so, you know, how how do you actually maintain a sense of wonder? Wonder is part of it, but that's even more sophisticated, right? So one thing about asana is you do you do the same poses over and over and over again. And it's not like you're trying to learn something new every time. You might, if you get lucky, you might learn something new. 
but that's not what it's talking about. Like what, what do you show up into your practice? What energy do you show up with? Right. And yeah, you, you, you could think of beginning mind means perpetual learner. Or I got more to learn because I'm inadequate and I don't know everything. So look, look at how that actually unpacks kind of a funny energy. Right. Like there's more for me to know and I need more. And somehow I'm not this, I'm not that. And so therefore I need to know more. And then if I know more, somehow knowing more will somehow get me somewhere closer to a finish line that doesn't actually exist. Right. You know, like what the hell? You're off on the wrong. Except I, I have that kind of mind. Right. So I get that. But so what the heck? How do I maintain innocence? And how do you believe in your own practice? One of the things I've found about, about my own practice is it really helps for me to stay engaged if I really think something important is happening in my own practice. Like some sort of secrets being revealed to me. But that what I've found over years is that that secret doesn't really have anything to do with anyone else. It doesn't give me knowledge that someone else doesn't have. Right. So, so your own practice doesn't make you right. Doesn't make you more yogic. Right. Something else needs to be occurring. Right. And there's something about innocence and about, so, you know, for the last few weeks, I've been talking a few months, actually, I've been talking a lot about what's the first step from emptiness into movement? How could that first impulse to movement um, be nonviolent? So way back when I remember I was in Shavasana and Joe, my teacher, was teaching Shavasana, which is so great when your teacher teaches Shavasana because you get to hear everything new and different and then there are lines you don't expect. And she said, soften the base of your tongue, which I kind of get it, soft, try it. It kind of softens the your inner ear. So I get how it starts to do something, the base of your tongue. But then she said, she said something like, no, really. Resist any urge to speak. Right. Don't just pause like you're going to speak again in a second. Don't even have the idea you're about to speak. Soften the base of your tongue. See if that changes anything for you. There's what your mind knows you're not going to speak, but then does your tongue know you're not going to speak? Because our faces are always ready for expression, right? So we're always in cue for our face to do work, right? So when you hear sop in the skin on your face, what does that even feel like? Because we're all ready to, this is how human beings interact, right? Right. And it's great. I'm so glad for facial expressions. Babies get all psyched about facial expressions. Right. But like, how do you like. For me, something happens where. Where there's. It helped me at one point. Feel about. That there's space, there's air between the skin on your face and the flesh of your cheeks. There's space between the skin on your forehead and your cranium. So if you start to go, wait, there's... And then you do that and you stop in the base of your tongue. And then... You slightly lift your chest and the whole universe changes. That's what I mean that something important is happening in your yoga practice. When you lift your chest, the universe changes. I don't mean that gives you power over the universe. 
something comes towards you and through you when you lift your chest. When you ground towards the earth, when you allow the dropping, and then you start to rise at the same time, and you keep the skin on your face soft and your jaw on the inside of your mouth and your lips together, teeth slightly apart, and you take the emptiness that comes from organing, softening the organs of perception, and you add asana and action in there, but you try to do it non nonviolently. And as you know, nonviolently is really hard. Don't don't be shallow about what you, what you think nonviolent is. It's really hard. What would it look for you to move without disturbing the pond? How connected would you have to be? Feel your feet on the foot pedals or on the floor. Feel your breath. The inhalation, the exhalation. Thing is, when you talk like this, it sounds so serious. Don't forget to be innocent. Do you know how to be innocent? Doesn't mean you have to be vulnerable. It's a good thing to practice. Being innocent. Keep your shape. There is an inside and outside to everything. Tongue is still soft. Notice and try to exhale from your back ribs. Drop your shoulder blades as you exhale. Change the shape of the whole universe on your inhale. Exhale into extension. Your rib cage is doing something miraculous. It's kissing your spine. Let go of your day. Prepare your mind to do yoga. As your mind begins to wane, stay innocent. Good, and then release. Take your sternum up towards your chin and your chin down and over your sternum. Have you played with how important that balance is between the lifted sternum and the dropped chin? Are you doing the poses? And raise your head up with closed eyes and open your eyes. So here's the line that I, I uh, wanted to start with and all the other stuff was a digression. I remember hearing Ingar say, um, 
which is related to everything I've been saying, um, I think, a, a conflicted mind is knowable. A calm mind is unknowable. Oh, no. One of the things that is there's a difference in the Western conception of knowing yourself. It's more about knowledge, right? They even say, do you know yourself? That'd be Socrates, right? Know thyself, right? Which already puts you in relationship to self, right? You have to know it. Well, who's no, you know, you're already in kind of a weird paradox, right? And one of the Eastern realizations, I think, is that, no, actually, your mind has to be unknowable or calmer in order for self to be realized. So you know those people that like a lot of drama? You know, they always make, maybe you have been one of them or are one now, you know, where you want the drama to keep you grounded. I tend to do that sometimes. Everything's kind of, sky's always falling just a little bit, right? And that keeps me grounded. It's a form of grounding. Right. So a conflicted mind, if you have tension in your life, it kind of helps your mind get traction. Right. So a conflicted mind is knowable. And a calm mind is unknowable. So reset yourself and start to soften the organs of perception again get really quiet take your mind offline wash your bowl And that quiet part helps me. I feel more innocent if I smile just a little bit. Right? It's like, oh, yeah. So the quiet doesn't have to be a collapse. It doesn't have to be Shavasana. It can be full. If you can stay innocent. What do these words mean? What the hell? Let's move around. Right? Thank goodness I don't have to stay in this static place where mental energy just feels so dead. Oh my God. Right? Like, what the hell? Moving around, getting that length, right? That leap. So I'm lifting up a little bit because I want my sitting bones to hang and my low back to lengthen. All right? Because we're constantly compressing. If you sit a lot, there's a constant compressing. What if like when you let your low back, you know, they say sitting's the new smoking. I'm still mad about that. But what if if you let if you don't get space in your back, some of the time you're actually covering up self? What the hell? What does that even mean? You know, you're just compressing the energy that's accessible to you. Right, so now you notice gravity shifts. So you're moving back and forth. And I hope some of you that can feel everything are damn lucky, but you're also not so lucky because when I shift, I can feel this really subtle, deep level of changes in my legs, right? 
And it, it it's not because I, I mean, some of you that can feel your skin and your bones and stuff, you can't really feel your bones exactly, but, or it's harder to. So I'm moving around and I'm watching gravity shifts like they're new to me, right? Like, wait, the hell that, you mean if I stop thinking I know what it is to move on my sitting bones, if I stop having that preconception a limiting assumption, and I actually feel what's going on, right? One of the things that I used to, you know, I've never had a student with a spinal cord injury that when they, when they start out telling me they don't have any sensation in their, you know, below the point of injury, honestly, in, in all my years, I've never been able to convince somebody that they're, I've always been able to convince someone they're mistaken within 20 minutes, Right. Like they get them to start going, they go, oh, wait, you mean that's what you mean by sensation? Yeah. Yep. 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 You get it. I'm taking my legs wide now because I'm just wanting to make more space here and push my knees out and have gravity shifts while opening my groin. Yeah, no, it's funny. And I've had multiple people say to me after, after about 20 minutes and they and they realize they do feel their whole body that and they need help it's not just a mental thing that they can they don't just imagine right but the, all of a sudden like multiple times i've seen their tears come and and they say something really unique i really think i love this and i'm leaning over to one side and i was trying to get things you know um they say on this weird level they just all of a said this just actually makes more sense of course I can feel my body, my whole body. It's like coming home to sense, right? That we have such a ableist conception of sensation, right? That there's a whole bunch of world between the mind being completely quiet and being dead, right? All right, so you're lifting up again. I'm gonna lift higher this time because I wanna get more hang, right? So I'm really trying to get my, my, my sitting bones to hang from my low back, right? Right, these are all things you might do to warm up for your yoga practice, right? Before you're doing asana, so you're trying to get sensation flowing in your whole body. So when I'm moving, can I feel the changes in each foot? Can I integrate, right? The weight changes on each foot. Some of you can feel that directly. I can't, right? But then I wanna make sure I have my sitting bones as part of the weight distribution. I'm trying to get more of me here. And then I wanna keep, as I'm moving, I wanna spread the space between my shoulder blades. Why? Because I wanna not grip life force, right? I wanna have more here. So when I start taking my arms wide, I'm going to have to put down my light here. It's put down my shade here. Keep moving back and forth and moving around. I'm getting blinded there. All right. Ooh, that's better. I'm no longer seeing spots in my vision. That's always a good thing, right? All right, so I'm going to take my arms so I can get bigger here for a second. And then I'm going to wonder, I'm going to change my gravity so I'm moving my, so I don't feel as off balance. I'm taking my arms wide again. Or if you're just going like this, or if you're just spreading here, I don't care, right? So I want you to spread. I don't want you to just lift your chest. I want you to spread the space between your shoulder blades. Spread the space across your sacrum, your very low back. So start to make a connection between this extension, 
across your low back this way, horizontal extension. And when you get them both going, then extend from the inner groin to the inner knee down to the inner heel. So you're going horizontally. You're not using your arms yet, right? To actually go down. And then really, so you're practicing more just with your spine, right? So you're you're trying to get horizontal to meet vertical, right? And then go down and then go up. So you're getting the, because we're going to take the arms wide in just a second, right? Because this is just like, you know, what happens when you just do your arms, at least for me, right? I have to strain up here and I lose some of my spine because I'm not as on as good a balance as most of you, right? So I'm going to go one arm at a time. So I'm going to make sure that I grab my wheelchair, right? Because I know, because I've been doing yoga a long time, that the more grounding that I have, the better my asana, right? So I'm going to grab my wheelchair over here and go here. Then I'm going to learn about how to do this even better. So if I reach too much, like I'm trying to extend too far, I lose my midline. So I've got to figure out how to take my arm wide, stay grounded, move back towards the midline with my shoulder blade so I can allow and extend past my fingertips. If I just try to reach, I'm being a typical human, right? The mind is actually taking too much control. Ironically, I have to go to the midline to express in the space, right? And then once I go to the midline, I need to have my legs go this way. I need that both to happen. All this is happening if I do a good yoga pose. I'm gonna go the other way. So now my balance on this side is different because I don't sit equally on my sitting bones. So I gotta figure out the right placement of my hand here, right? So for this side, I'm probably gonna grab the seat between my legs because I can tell you need two things for a yoga pose, a center of gravity and a sense of direction, right? And so I'm trying to make sure I maintain my best center of gravity, right? And then trying to figure out again, I have to ro de-rotate my scoliosis here, take my shoulder blade this way to go out beyond my fingertips. And then if I want to amplify it, I go down through my sitting bones, up through the top of my head, and it's a good time to breathe, right? But it's a lot. When my mind tries to do too many things at once, I don't know about you, but do you hold your breath? I do, right? Yeah. I do. Dang, dog pose, right? Oh, wait. Vertical and horizontal. Okay, so I'm going to have a vertical plane. My arms are more straight, right? And I hit down with my palms. I'm going to pull, drive, draw energy up my palms, right? I'm going to make sure it connects to the outside edge of my shoulders, of my side body there, my systemus dorsi muscles, right? And I'm going to, but now I'm going to actually broaden across my collarbones and broaden across my sacrum. Lift my sternum again. Breathe. Good, and then release. Somehow that pose is a little bit between up dog and down facing dog, right? Because you're kind of more up here. Down facing dog would be more down. So this time we're going to like make sure that you're not emphasizing lifting your chest so much. We're going to go look down at the floor. We're going to go towards the moon. Right? And the earth. And then we're going to do the same pose. But we're not going to reach up as much. So I'm going to look down. It helps me a lot to look down. 
right? But I want to get this vertical, horizontal, and then when I, so that's hard here, when you're in a wheelchair like this, is that, or in a chair like this, you have to get down to your feet, right? So you're using the vertical and horizontal to increase the grounding. So you can hit down through your sitting bones, hit down from the inner groin to the inner knee down to the inner heel. Keep both simul vertical and horizontal going right now. Good, and then release. Yeah. So what happens to me when I do it like for a longer period like that is that especially for me, the whole pose starts to transform when I really get my arms hitting right. Right. Because it's hard to get your legs working really well. So remember the idea of, a, of when you bring the muscle towards the bone, the subtle body disperses through the whole body. Right. So if you can get your arms working pretty well, you you can find your legs differently. Right. And so that's true. Even if you use you, 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 people that can feel their legs, you're mostly feeling the outside of your legs. So really have a beginning mind here to the experience that there's an inside of your legs that aren't controlled by muscle that isn't controlled by muscular action. Right. <clears throat> All right. So what happens to me when I hold the pose too long, I start to squeeze my muscles too tight. Right. So this and I can feel the effect of it right now. It's part of why I lost my breath. Right. I'm going to this time be more mindful or try to be aware. But in order to be aware, my mind has to stop trying so hard. I'm going to be aware of what it is to engage the muscle towards the bone. I'm going to pay a lot of attention. And to show my mind what I mean, everyone just overgrip your arm quick, like squeeze your upper arm bone with, with your, put it down and just do it really hard, really fast, right? That would be dumb. That'd be a lack of intelligence and a lot of will. Now I'm going to get into the position. I'm going to look down. And I'm going to not engage all the way yet, but I'm going to be way more aware as an observer of how I spread my palms, how I extend my finger, how my fingers, how I press down, how I rotate my tricep up towards the ceiling, my bicep up towards the ceiling, how I extend. So I'm, as I'm going horizontal and vertical, I'm trying to watch and release again and bring back in Shavasana. I'm going to get, I'm going to let it all drop. And then I'm going to repose. Repose is a big, important idea in, in poses, right? I'm going to watch how I come into fruition. And I'm going to try to learn there. Watching the how, I'm going to drop my arms again and start again. Because how you're coming to the bone, we're trying to get a better connection to the legs, right? You're trying to have your arms teach your legs. Okay, so I'm doing it while I'm staying down. I'm coming into the pose. And I'm open to the fact that it's not just the arm action I'm supposed to pay attention to. I'm looking for how it throws water to the inside of the jar, right? I'm paying attention to what I'm receiving. Good, and then release. Every action, you get to receive something from it, right? And your mind is not good at receiving. And this light or the water in the inside of the jar, it's all about receiving it, right? So what's the sense of direction in dog pose? Hmm. Hmm. So your rational mind wants to go, it must be in a straight line or it must be this way or that way. 
or what must it be in a pose? It's got to be a direction. So it's got to be one thing as opposed to another. Are you sure? Are you sure about that? I'm not so sure. Right? So here I'm going to try it again. How do I use my body, engage my body, better way to say it, so I become lighter, so I'm fuller? Do your best dog pose now. And if you grip too hard to do your best dog pose, we have to have a chat. A hundred percent will is never your best dog pose. Ever. A hundred percent engagement, not your best pose. Your mind gets in the way. So, and then release. So how do you, how do you um, start to bring the, the upper arm, let, let's say, towards the bone, right? How do you do that? And yet not disturb the pond. Huh. Let's try it again. Well, it's going to help to practice it like 10,000 times, by the way. Right. I've got to start. So let me try to say something again. So one of the things I've been trying to talk about for the last couple of years is hinting in and out about what it is, you know, on some level, in some of the yogic texts, they talk about the pure observer, right, which is egoless and all these other words they try to say about it, right, which means it's not about knowledge, right? So I, I often think about if water is coming into a field, like a, like maybe even as rain, you're not the water, you're not the field, you're the entire space. And there are things happening in it, right? You actually become the empty space. The perpetual observer of action is probably empty space, right? So if you can get, so as you're coming into your pose now, Oh my God, you mean I should maybe try to soften the base of my tongue and open the skin on my face and find where my sitting bones are and start to get all the things in place and still stay back, Pratyahara, back in your pose so you're the observer and not the doer. This is why repetitive doing something allows you not to get so caught in the doing is you start to have things happen in your poses that doesn't disturb the observer because you're not having to work your arms so hard or your sitting bones or your legs. I'm going to look down because I want the earth in this dog pose. Good, and then release. Hmm. Hmm. Take the legs off. What happens to me when I get that, say I get too serious and I get in too little of space, my mind thinks oh, it'll be more real if I can just get more focused. 
right? But if I'm not staying light as I'm really working a pose, there's a good chance I'm not being the observer in it, right? So I'm going over to one side and I'm not doing big actions. I'm just trying to ground down towards the earth, push down, lift my chest, things we do every week, right? Mm -hmm. Now I wanna make sure I have the feeling of expansion. So now my legs are wide. So there's a triangle, like there's a triangle from your sitting bone to your knees, right? And then there's your spine. And then your arms go in. And you hit down through your sitting bones. You try to hit down through your feet. Oof. Try to keep your chest lifted. Shoulder blades dropping. Good. And then release. I'm going to go over. Fall this way. Open this way. So I'm trying to watch, so I'm trying to watch all this stuff, right? I'm like, okay, I like this movement. It seems really kind of fun. Like, there's the party, right? But I'm trying to watch my arm cut through, move through me like a hand through water, right? But as my hand's moving, I'm moving through my subtle body too. That's why you need the lightness, right? You want to get that, that you're not just moving your arm and your muscle up, you're actually moving all of your space, empty space and body up, right? And then hand goes back through the water that is you. What, this is crazy talk. Did I tell you to be innocent? Be innocent here. Actually believe that stuff like this is possible, right? Would you be like the little kid that doesn't know limits anymore? Right? So I'm leaning this way. And I'm thinking, okay, any movement, if I'm activated in my empty spaces, any movement travels right through me. So I'm practicing again. Right? Yeah, I'm moving my body, but I'm moving right through my spinal field, right? And I'm hitting down to keep it grounded. So I'm down on my leg here, right? So I can keep it grounded. So I can feel what's happening. And I'm changing gravity and I'm doing a whole bunch of things, right? And I'm making my soup be like not just empty i'm giving the putting like cornstarch in the soup in the gravy right i'm feeling it then i'm gonna pop into the pose and then down and i'm keeping the base of my tongue soft the space of my on my face. I'm doing all this if I can remember. You know why you do yoga poses so much? So many times it's so you don't have to remember everything. <laughs> These things just happen because you've done it so many times, legs together. You've done it so many times that all of it just starts happening, right? There's no way not to do the poses. No matter how smart you are, you gotta do the poses, right? Forward, ground. I just sometimes need to start the week with a good, Cobra or up dog, where it comes right out of the earth. Here goes my spine. I'm not reaching for the sun. I'm going from clay to air, right? And then really try it again. Try it again. Forward. 
pop right out of the clay. Broaden across the collarbones, broaden across the sacrum, reach the clay to the sun, but keep your water. If you race to the sun and then release, if you race to the sun, you'll burn your water. Don't race to the sun. Okay. Forward again, fight in the earth. What are you talking about? Did I mention be innocent? Right? What do you mean race to the sun? It's racing to me, for God's sakes. Right? Up, lift, ground. Feel, breathe. I don't know. Celebrate. Good, and then release. What? Celebrate. I one of the things about um upward facing dog or cobra, especially upward facing dog, that has been I have done that pose a lot in 33 years. And I spent years and years working at it too hard, gripping the shit out of it. Oh, oh, I'm strong, I'm gonna get stronger, I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna, you know. And then I started going, wait, it's gonna get me in a tight space, but I wanna still have the lightness in the tight space. Right, but it doesn't mean I don't want to lift my chest and get it up towards the sun. But I have to be light in a tight space that's not very big, and it's especially tight for me because I'm fused in my upper thoracic. So my 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 upper thoracic through here does not bend. Right, I spent years trying to bend that bad boy. That was dumb. Right, because I thought that must be more yoga. Right, I'm gonna come forward again. But I'm gonna like rock a little bit because <laughs> because I want to have the lightness, right? So when I snap into this pose, I want to make sure my brain is remembering to light in, let in this rest of the field, right? Like there's a whole bunch of energy here, okay? And then oh no, so like. Already my mind knows I'm gonna get intense. So I've already screwed up my pose. I've already screwed up my field, right? Damn it. So I'm rocking again. And then here I come. And I know what's coming, but I'm gonna try not to limit anything. I know I'm gonna effort here in a second, but I'm gonna find Shavasana. I'm gonna find the quiet. And I'm going to let it feel like a smile. Then I'm going to start to engage. Right? But I'm trying to, going to try to keep all that lightness with me as I start to do the pose that my mind wants to do. Right? That wants to make it really intense. You hear my voice straining because I am working hard, right? It may not look like it, but let me tell you, right now there's some shit going on, right? Good, and then whew. I'm gonna do some light again, right? And I go like, wait, so how I come to the bone when I start to engage? has to not lose sight of this lightness that I'm trying to find through rhythm and play. Here I come again, land, ground. Mine's gotta stay steady so I don't grip too much. Here I go start and I'm gonna broaden across my sacrum, find my legs, broaden the space between my shoulder blades, drop my shoulder blades find where the center of my sternum is and start to lift my chest, keeping it all open. Oh my God, I've overdone it. I've actually screwed this one up. I can feel it right now. I'm gonna repose. 
I'm going to try it again. Because damn it, I can tell as soon as you go off track. So I'm going to start it again, right? Maybe you did a perfect one. If you're doing a perfect one, you just like keep doing it. And find it again. Now I got to remember to smile. Got to get my intensity and my smile. Going to start grounding. So God dang, I'm so much happy when I keep the earth, earth with me, right? And then here I go. I'm going to start going up. Up. Oh, here comes the focus. The stream out of the hose is getting stronger. I got to stay open. Hmm. My muscles are beginning to quake. Ugh. Ugh. I gave that one about a C minus. Right? That's okay. Inhale, lift up. I don't suck all the way. I just don't mind when I haven't done a great pose. Inhale, lift up, exhale, revolve. Trying to squeeze some of this out. Right? And then back. And then as I take my arm up, I want to use that to feel my feet. What? And then I come back through my own soup. And then I find my soup and I smile in my own soup. Inhale, lift up, exhale, revolve. Good, and then come on back. So the line that just popped into my head was, you're not just pushing your own soup in, in an asana, you're moving through your own soup, right? I'm gonna go from my midline I'm going to take my arm up and I'm going to open the universe differently. I'm going to like have it come through me differently. Because I get to say these things to myself in my own practice. It doesn't have to make sense to anybody else. Right? And I go and I'm going to turn. And then I'm going to like turn and get the water moving differently through my being by twisting my spine. Inhale, lift up, exhale, revolve. Yes, lift on your collarbones. Yes, do all the things you know, right? But keep the midline. So take the right outside of your right, your left rib cage and move it back towards your right hip, right? As you twist. So something's resisting as something's opening. So the water runs better back to center. So what I was saying is, as I was going this way, this rib cage, floating rib, needs to go back towards the opposite hip because that keeps the midline, which keeps the fountain going better. Right? So, again, I'm going to move through my own space again. Inhale up, move through my own soup. I'm going to do it again because I like the feeling I'm moving through my own soup. Right? Not just moving my arm, my soup's all out of here, in here. You don't just end at the terminus of your body. You totally don't. That's the magic of spines. And then I'm going to go, exhale and go. I move through my soup. Find a way to grab so my soup stays lit. Oh, yeah, and here's that, that floating rib. I'm going to move it towards the back hip. All right? So I'm going to find the midline. And then I'm going to lift my sternum. Inhale, lift up. Of course, lift on your collarbones. Go for the sun. Keep the moon by spreading the space between your shoulder blades. Hit down through your legs from the inner groin to the inner knee to the inner, inner heels and keep twisting. Now I've overdone it. I can tell you right now, I need to get lighter. So I'm going to look to spread out my soup a little bit. How do I do that? I have to let go of my pose a little bit and then come back into the pose. I have to repose and then back to center. I have to repose. I have to reinvent. Have you ever noticed how cool it is? This sounds like such barf, what I'm about to say. I'm going to come forward on my elbows here. Um, that 
every day you actually, the universe doesn't mind if you reinvent yourself. It actually makes space for you. It doesn't, if you want to be more constricted and shut down, the universe is going to go, okay, too bad for you, right? If you take up more space, the universe is going to go, all right, but what took you so long? What took you so long? Hmm. Can you believe how much your mind shuts you off from the, the happening of the universe? I'm sure it had a good reason. It's got things to do. People to see. People to call. Except now I'm going to like try to let it on grit. Well, let it get in the empty part that's unknowable. They start softening around my temples and preparing for Shavasana. I'm going to let in the whole field, not just what I think I have to do, who I think I have to be. So I'm going to start letting in my chair. Let it hold me up. Hmm. Hmm. I naturally want to soften the inside of my mouth. I don't know about you. A whole bunch of things start to change naturally. Because I've done enough shavasana. I'm going to figure out a way to lean against my chair now. Put my fingertips together so I stay sensitive. I can't help but smile. What the hell? That can't be right. Maybe it is.
Feel your breath. Don't change it. Think your body. Think it again. Start to bring yourself back. Slightly deeper inhalation, slightly longer exhalation. When you're ready, open your eyes. Close them. You get to choose, open them again. One of the things that the energy with which you explore in your practice, don't have it just be an effort to try to gain more knowledge. Don't do that to your practice. That'll happen with practice. You'll gain more knowledge. If you seek more knowledge, too bad for you, <laughs> right? I mean, isn't your innocent parts the best part? Who got us to trade our innocence? What the hell did this freaking happen? Oh no, it seems too vulnerable. Innocence is too vulnerable. Are you kidding me? Innocence is one of the most potent, powerful things there that this universe has. And Nothing's not innocent, right? Ever. We got sold some goods. <laughs> and they have they got some smarts to them, you know. I get why. Apparently, unworthiness is an energy that can be leveraged into action. I get it. You should be better. You should all be better yogis, all of you. If you only practice to be a better yogi, you're going straight to hell. All right, hands together. If you can, namaste. Spirit in me, bows the spirit in you. You know, I'm still 